Good evening, everybody, and welcome to The Real Review Live. Hugh and Hook speaking to you. And this is our 23rd Real Review Live session. And so we're very pleased to have you on board. Um, I know there's quite a lot of you tuned in, and some of you have ordered the wines direct from the wineries. Even if you've only got uh, one bottle, it's still good fun to, to, drink, to sip along and drink what we're tasting here. If you haven't got one of our wines, um, have something else open, something suitable, and uh, that will make the whole thing a bit more enjoyable, hopefully. The format we use here is that, uh, that I will talk about the first two wines, then we'll take some questions, and then we'll do the next two wines, and then two more questions, and so on, until we get to the end of the eight wines. And uh, so we do urge you, we encourage you to, to send in questions um, to, to the real review as we go along. Uh, they could be questions that just uh, that, that relate to what I'm talking about, or that could do something else that, uh, that, that is on your mind. The, the, tonight, it's all about the Mornington Peninsula, which is uh, one of the most exciting, I think, regions in Australia right now. It's a cool climate region. It's down south. It's um, you know, almost down to Tasmania. It pokes out into the Bass Strait, and uh, it's surrounded on three sides by sea, which moderates the climate beautifully. They're very, very fortunate people down there, the vignerons down there, because they're avoiding a lot of the droughts and stresses and, um, and bushfire problems with smoke taint and all those things that have been affecting other regions of Australia over the last uh, few years. Um, I don't want to wish any plagues on them, so I shouldn't say too much about that. But it is a very small region in terms of numbers. There are about 200 vineyards and 50 wineries. There's just under 1,000 hectares of vineyards planted down there. The scale of the Mornington Peninsula is a bit, a bit similar to Tasmania. Both of them uh, amount to just under 1% of Australia's total vineyard area, but it's a very, very important 1% because of the quality of their wines, the prices they uh, fetch, and so on. Um, it is much more than 1% in terms of its meaning to the Australian quality wine industry. Um, it's directly south of Melbourne, of course, uh, down the peninsula, which curls around Port Phillip Bay. Port Phillip Bay is on the western side of the peninsula, and on the eastern side is Western Port Bay. Um, most of the vineyards are exposed to the Port Phillip Bay side, but there are lots of vineyards also on the Western Port side, uh, which is uh, a windy side, which is exposed to cooler weather patterns coming up from Bass Strait. Uh, we will taste several of those wines that are on that side of the peninsula. We will taste wines from the other side of the peninsula. We'll taste wines from up the hill and down the hill, as they say in the peninsula. Up the hill being on Red Hill, which is the highest part, up to about 250, almost 300 metres altitude. And down the hill is much lower altitude, almost sea level, uh, around about the 100 metre mark or below. Um, Pinot Noir is by far the most planted variety in the Mornington Peninsula. And um, they use it for red wine and rosé and sparkling wine. In fact, 52% of what, uh, what vines are planted on the peninsula are Pinot Noir. Chardonnay comes a distant second with 27%. Pinot Gris and Grigio is 13%. And that's quite interesting because I don't think there's any other region in Australia that has as much Pinot Grigio as a proportion of its plantings than Mornington. And I would mount the argument that the best Pinot Gris does come from the Mornington Peninsula. It was the pioneer for Pinot Gris. We're not having Pinot Gris tonight. I just thought I'd mention it, but tonight it's all about Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. We've got four of each, and I think they're going to be quite outstanding, these wines. Um, Mornington, of course, is a great destination, of course, for, for tourists as well, because it has it's a beautiful area scenically. It's high and undulating, and the highest parts it has, you know, English trees and English plants, and looks like a little bit of England in parts. Uh, big oak trees and so on, um, but it's a very beautiful area all through. Um, it has wonderful restaurants in a lot of the wineries now. There are nice places to stay. It really does cater for the tourists. And being within, you know, an hour's drive of morning of, of Melbourne, um, you know, obviously there's a captive market in Melbourne, so it needs to be very user-friendly. It needs to be 
um, geared towards the sophisticated tourist market. So it is a great place to visit. Um, I think I'll just get straight into it uh, without any more preamble. Um, I'll talk about the terroir as we go. Um, there are varied, obviously varied soil types and varied mesoclimates on the peninsula and they all influence the styles of wine from the vineyards grown on them. Um, high altitude, low altitude, aspects are different, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other, the one thing about Mornington that I could mention is, is that um, there are no really big wineries there and there are no cheap wines there. There are no ordinary wines produced there. It's a really high quality focused region. Um, some of the wineries are owned by the big corporates. For example, Tegallant is owned by Treasury. Estonia is owned by Accolade, but they're still very much um, uh, boutique style wineries producing high quality wine. And it has to be high quality because the prices they need to charge need to be high because of the value of the real estate down there. Um, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, it's got a little burgundy really, uh, Mornington Pinchot. It's, um, uh, those are the two great varieties of burgundy, of course, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. We're gonna start off with Chardonnay from one of the coolest sites in the Mornington Peninsula, which is down the Western Port side of the peninsula. Um, near Flinders, um, and it's Nazare. Nazare, um, let me just say a little more about the site. It's, it's, it's about 150 metres altitude, so it's not right down at sea level, but it's very exposed to the windy weather from Western Port Bay. And uh, when uh, Param Deep, the man who uh, um, established it, uh, was was talking to local vineyards about it. They said, you, you've got rocks in your head, go and buy an established vineyard somewhere else. It's too windy there, it's too difficult. But he already owned the land and he was a persistent man, so he kept with it. And we're thankful that he did. It's only a tiny little region, tiny little vineyard. It's about, um, I think, uh, five, five hectares in size. And um, it grows a number of grape varieties. There's a bit of Shiraz there as well, I believe, not just Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Gris. Um, but Param Deep is one of the most interesting people in the industry because he is one of the very few vignerons in Australia who was born in India. And he didn't even actually taste wine for the first time until he was 30 years old. And in fact, Apparently, he was on his way out to Australia as a migrant when he first tasted wine. It was on the plane and it was champagne and he decided that he liked it. So when he bought his bit of land down there, he dabbled with a few ideas about olive trees and, you know, the usual thing. It had been a cattle farm, but eventually he settled on wine grapes. And it's, a, um, it's quite a, um, an environmentally friendly operation he has there. He's planted a lot of trees for windbreaks. He does everything uh, with minimal chemical intervention, no herbicides, um, and he's very aware of sustainability and those issues. Anyway, let's, um, uh, let's move along to, I believe he's actually done a wine course as well at Charles Sturt University if not Charles said some of the other um, short courses that you can do around the place to learn about viticulture and winemaking. And he's obviously got a good handle on it because he's making some very good wine indeed. So the first wine is Nazare. That's the name of his property. Nazare, which means beautiful visions, I believe. Single Vineyard Chardonnay 2019. Um, and let's taste the wine. It is uh, two years old, and so it's got you know a lightish, light to medium yellow colour, a very bright colour, very attractive, about how, what you would expect for a wine of its age. And the bouquet is very complex. It's got buttery, creamy, shortbread-like aromas. Um, there is lemon and citrus and grapefruit hovering underneath it. But the, the main thing I have immediately noticed is these creamy, buttery, um, shortbread-like aromas, which I think are partly to do with leaves contact. There's been some leaves contact in the, in the maturation of the wine. But also, I think he's allowed the wine to go through a malolactic fermentation. And cold climate wines, which have high natural acidity, often need to have a malolactic to reduce the level of acidity 
a little bit um, and make them more balanced. The wine still has lively acidity, but uh, malolactic can add some buttery dairy-like notes to the aroma as well, which gives more complexity. It's a lovely nose. It really makes you want to have a sip. Mm, yeah, and it tastes like a cool climate wine. Plenty of acidity. It's taut, racy, lively, cleansing acidity, energetic wine with a long, long carry and a little bit of grip as well, which will help it to go with food. This wine has the potential to age well, but it's drinking beautifully now. Um, and I think that um, if it hadn't had that malolactic fermentation, the acidity might have been quite high because it's still quite crisp and fresh. I like that because it really adds to that um, appetizing nature of the wine. It's delicious. We scored at 93 out of 100, which is a high silver ribbon. And we've said drink it from now until it's 10 years old, so 2029. It will keep longer if you sell it well. And it's 13, number 13 out of 41 Peninsula Chardonnays from that vintage that we've tasted. Um, it's $45 a bottle. It's not ridiculously expensive. And we asked Paramdeep what he, what he would like to serve with it. And being of Indian origin, no surprises, he uh, suggested a curry. But I suspect it's a mild curry. He doesn't say how strong it is, but he says... Chicken and cashew curry um, sounds great to me. Um, I think a strongly spicy curry, too much heat might kill this wine, might not be the best thing, but a mild curry would go very well indeed. Excellent. I'm going to have another sip. Really quite a small production wine, 900 litres. A hundred dozen bottles is all he made of it, four barrels. And um, um, this is a this really is a boutique producer. Most of its wine, I suspect, is sold direct from the cellar door. So you probably don't see probably don't see the wines in shops very often. You might actually have to go on the website to buy it. And of course, there is the click through. Uh, on the Real Review website, you can buy direct just by clicking on that. We don't sell wine. It'll take you through to the winery website, though. So moving along to number two, which is the, uh, it's also a cool climate. Well, they're all cool climate, but this is one of the cooler parts of the peninsula, as Nazare is. It's Point Leo Estate. I'll put that on the thing over there where you can see it better. It's um, Point Leo Estate is also on the other side of the peninsula facing Western Port Bay, therefore colder and more windy than the Port Phillip side. So this is a, a relatively newly launched brand, Port, Point Leo Estate. Uh, the Gandal family, who have been famous, uh, very notable in, in Melbourne for being developers of um, commercial buildings and shopping centres, um, they planted this vineyard at point, near Point Leo, which is not far from Merrick's and quite close to the Point Leo beach. Uh, very windy site. I've been there. Um, you wonder, you do wonder how, <clears throat> whether the wind um, actually restricts the growth of the vines a bit and helps to keep the yields down, which is not such a bad thing if you're trying to make top quality wine. It's a showpiece property, Point Leo Estate, because they've got a wonderful building there, which is the cellar door sales and a restaurant, a hatted restaurant called Laura. Um, very distinguished restaurant, one of the best on the peninsula. Great place to eat. I can recommend it. Um, and we look out the windows at Western Port Bay and French Island and the sculpture park. They have one of the most amazing sculpture parks there featuring really large outdoor sculptures made by great artists from all over the world. It's a really quite unique property and uh, strongly recommend a visit there. There isn't a winery there, but the wines are made for them elsewhere. I think they're made at Stonia, um, where Mike Simons and Will Byron do their thing. And Todd Dexter has the overall control of the winemaking. Talk about Todd Dexter a bit more lately, later rather. Um, let's taste the wine. This is a, um, I'm expecting to find a, a 
a delicate wine or a strained wine, a cool climate wine, but it's also a reserve Chardonnay, Point Leo Estate Reserve Chardonnay 2018. So reserve tends to have more power generally. Let's have a look at this. The color is quite light, lightish to medium yellow, a bit lighter than the previous one. It's 2018, which is a year older, but that's a really quite light color for an 18 Chardonnay. Suggests that it's going to be, that it's aging slowly. And the first thing I smell is this smoky reductive character, as I would call it. Uh, it's a kind of sulfide. It's a, thing, uh, it's, a, it's a feature that a lot of Chardonnay makers, especially in Victoria, are using now to add complexity of their wine. It's a very much a burgundy derived um, um, aspect of winemaking. And that there is a lot of complexity. There's nutty aromas, there's toasty aromas. And I'm sure that if you let that wine sit in the glass for long enough, you'll smell more and more of the citrus fruit aromas too, typical of Mornington Chardonnay. Hmm. And that wine is, well, that wine is piercing and incisive and crisp and vital, racy. It's um, an energetic wine. Very refreshing, very appetizing, crisp acidity. I suspect they also have some malolactic fermentation here, but I can't detect it at all. And the acidity is, is, um, is bright, but it's certainly not excessive. In fact, that acid will help this wine go with food, especially creamy fish, uh, buttery things, chicken, lobster, mm, all that sort of stuff. Oh, that's a, that's a gorgeous wine. There's lovely finesse to that wine. It's restrained. It's going to age well. It's going to get richer and richer as it ages. It's good now, but it'll be better, I think, in a year or two. Um, what can we say about, uh, yes, how did we score it? We scored it 94 out of 100, which is a very high silver, almost a gold ribbon. Um, it's number seven out of 50 Chardonnays from the peninsula in that vintage, 2018. So it's a very high ranking wine. In fact, we give it a top rank badge because uh, that's, that's our system of um, you know, rating wines. Uh, we've said drink it now until 2028. So until it's 10 years old to be on the safe side. But if you sell it well, it'll go for longer, I'm sure. It's a $56 wine. So it's, it's not that high in terms of Mornington Peninsula Chardonnay. Um, I can already smell that the... The bouquet is changing. It's losing a bit of the smoky sulfides and there's more fruit poking through already. Uh, the chief winemaker, Todd Dexter, we asked him what food he would put with this and he said, wood roasted chicken served with silver beet and king brown mushroom cream. Sounds great to me. Okay, so I'll put that to one side and I'll take a couple of questions if there are some questions. Um, and we do have a question here that came in earlier um, from someone who's online, Graham Walker. And he says, um, do you think Mornington Peninsula Pinot Noir and Chardonnay have perceptible characteristics distinctive of the region or sub-region? For example, when people talk about Burgundy, they, they make um, statements about what Pellini Monrachet tastes like in comparison to Chassin Monrachet or Merceau and so on. Um, are there distinctive flavor profiles that come to mind for Mornington? <sighs> no, not really. Um, Mornington, like any region, um, it, the, the, the most important thing, especially when the wines are young, is the thumbprint of the winemaker and the thumbprint of the site. So you can say that up the hill, Red Hill area, tastes like this and downhill tastes like that. You could say Red Hill tastes, Chardonnay, for example, tastes crisper, lighter, finer, paler, more aromatic, higher acidity, uh, leaner sort of wine. They're richer down the hill. This is a great generalization and you'll find exceptions to every rule. And there is one that we're about to come up against, which is this wine here, which I think it's down the hill wine, but it tastes like an up the hill wine. And we're gonna have an example with the Pinots too just by coincidence. Um, a lot depends, um, you know, if you talk about the up the hill sites, it depends whether you've got a north facing or south facing site. Uh, 
Estonia's, for example, have vineyards, single vineyard wines, lots of single vineyard wines, and lots of them come from the same area that the winery is in, which is uh, Merricks, but they have different aspects and they're planted to different clones of Chardonnay. So you get different flavours. So it's really hard to generalise. We're about to come to Prancing Horse. Prancing Horse is near Peringa Estate in the Red Hill area, but it has a different aspect to the Peringa Estate vineyards. So the wines taste quite different. I'll tell you more about that in a sec. But I think it's really hard to generalise about things like that. And I think it's hard to generalise in Burgundy as well. You say that, um, I think you've mentioned Chambon Messini is supposed to be subtle yet elegant, not without depth with notes of violet. Well, you could probably say that about just about any wine in Burgundy at any particular stage. There are, the variety is enormous. And as soon as you start to think you've got something pinned down, a wine comes along that completely makes you change your mind. So it's a difficult thing, Graham. We can say that Mornington Peninsula wines are generally finer and more subtle than, say, Hunter Valley wines. But even that is... Um, you will find lots of hunter wines that are Chardonnays that are being made in a modern style and which um, are really hard to tell as hunter wines. Okay, Prancing Horse, Mornington Peninsula Chardonnay. Uh, this is the Muriel. This is an interesting wine. It's nothing to do with Muriel's wedding, um, which I thought was wonderful, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is the magnificent Muriel Reserve Chardonnay 2019. Um, and that's a bit of a story in itself because the owner, Tony Hansey, or the owners, Tony and Kathy Hansey, um, a member of their family of a previous generation whose name was Muriel, and she was evidently a much loved and very popular woman. She was born in 1920, so she would have been 100, 100 years old in 2020, which is when this wine went on sale. So they decided to name it in her honour. That's the story behind it. Um, uh, Prancing Horse Estate is, as I said, in the Red Hill area near Paringa Estate. In fact, I think it's in Paringa Road. Uh, but it's a, a more southerly facing site, whereas Peringa's site is more northerly facing. Peringa can even ripe, ripen Shiraz on their site. It's a warm site in a cool area. Whereas um, the Prancing Horse, I doubt if they could ripen Shiraz there, but they do make a very crisp um, and delicate style of Pinot Noir. And it's a, it's a classically uphill style of Mornington Pinot but we're on the Shiraz now. So let's talk about, sorry, the Chardonnay now. So let's talk about Chardonnay. This, um, this wine, they don't, have a, they don't have a winery, but the wines are made by the people at Muraduck Estate, which um, Rick McIntyre and Jeremy Magar, who do a fantastic job. Um, and Prancing Horse is uh, starting to become better known now. It's, um, it's been around for a while, but it had a pretty slow start but I think they're really starting to hit their straps now. They've got new plantings which are coming on stream. Um, this one, let's taste it. Um, good colour. I mean, that's a you know, straw yellow colour of the right depth for a two-year-old Chardonnay. And there is a spicy, smoky, toasty, slightly buttery nose with a lot of artifact characters. There's quite a lot of oak there. There's creamy leaves characters. There's, um, ah, there's a lot going on in this wine. Really interesting. Um, there's a touch of honey. I often think when you've got the honey thing and the nutty thing, you've got a sort of a nougat-like aroma and this wine has it. It's a bouquet that makes me want to taste the wine and expect to find something really good. Very good. It's a powerful wine. For a wine that's made from up the hill, um, 2019 was quite a big year. The wines were quite big generally, it seems to me. But this wine has a big palate and it's there's quite a bit of astringency there, which I think is coming from the oak. And there's a bit of warmth from the alcohol. It's nearly 14%, which isn't actually very high for a Chardonnay. But 
it, um, I think it's starting to integrate. Uh, when I did my tasting note on this wine was a year ago, I think, and I think the wine is already starting to integrate better and even another year we'll, we'll see this wine tasting even better. It's only a 19 vintage, so it's young. But it's a generous wine, a lot of flavour. How do we score it? 92 out of 100. And it's 23 out of 41 from wines from the peninsula, Chardonnay's from the peninsula in that vintage. We've said drink it from now until 2030. So it's a 10, 11, 12 year wine. Um, and uh, the winemaker has not given us a food match, but I'm going to suggest that something really rich would go really well with this. I'm, I'm a great fan of spicy um uh, buttery things with Chardonnay, such as um, a risotto with uh, with lots of butter in it and and prawn tails in it, or or uh, scampi or uh, Morton Bay bag uh, meat, something like that, or even lobster. And when I think of lobster with this one, I'm thinking lobster thermidor, which is a big flavoured dish, and this is a big one that which can handle a big flavoured dish. Very good. Next wine is Crittenden Estate. So Gary Crittenden, I've already mentioned, I think was one of the pioneers of the modern era in Mornington Peninsula, firstly at Dramana Estate um, and then at Crittenden Estate. And interestingly, he still has the original vineyard that he planted at Dramana Estate. And those, wine, those vines are now 35 years old. They were planted in the early to mid 80s. Gary Crittenden is quite uh, a significant fellow in the history of Australian wine. He, um, he was also a part owner and founder of the Toll Puddle Vineyard in Tasmania, which is now owned by Shaw and Smith, but originally was, there was a syndicate of people, one of whom was Gary. Uh, he was a nursery man originally. He's a, definitely a green thumbs man, a plant man. Um, and after being a, a nursery man and falling in love with wine and deciding to have a vineyard, he became a full-time vineyard And he helped a lot of people down on the peninsula establish their vineyards and uh, left quite a legacy behind him. He's still around, of course, but he's retired. And his son, Rollo, is the winemaker today and is doing a great job. His daughter, Zoe, is also involved. and. Of course, this wine uh, is from down the hill. It's from Dramana, near Dramana. So you might expect this to be a fuller, richer, more coloured wine than it is. Um, and, uh, you know, conform to the stereotype of down the hill, but it's not. Let me taste it. I'll try and describe it to you. First thing is the colour is light. This is probably the lightest colour wine we've had so far. And it's a 19 vintage, so but it's really good colour. And when I smell that, it's got a really lovely creamy white nose, which comes largely, I think, from ageing on yeast leaves. But there is oatmeal, there's cashew nut, there's a bit of almond. Um, it, I haven't used any fruit descriptors yet because they're a bit in hiding, but I know they're there. And that wine, if you give it air or give it a bit of age, those fruit aromas will reveal themselves. But it's a really complex, gently spicy kind of nose, really gorgeous nose, but fresh and youthful and undeveloped. Hmm. And just as you might expect from the nose and the colour, the palate is restrained, it's tight, it's tensioned, it's got beautiful compactness and finesse to it on the palate. It will definitely fill out with more time in the bottle. It's already a glorious wine, but I think it'll just keep going up from here. Cork, by the way, but it's a good cork. It's a yam cork, which is guaranteed to be free of taint. Um, not perfect, not as good as a screw cap in my view, but better than, better than a lot of corks anyway. We've, we've scored this wine 95 out of 100. And we've said drink now until 2029. So another wine that's got a 10-year window. I think a 10-year window is pretty safe for these wines, but they will go, go longer if they're well-sellered. 
so 95 was a gold ribbon score. It ranked seven out of 41 Chardonnays from the peninsula in that year, 2019, which means it's a top rank wine. It's an $80 wine. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what you're expecting to pay now from the top wines of that area. Um, food match, we've asked Rollo Crittenden what he would have with this wine, and he said, pan-fried snapper fillets with a lemon caper butter. Sounds great to me. Can't wait. Um, I think that's an excellent wine, but we now have time for two more questions. And one of our regulars, Peter Gunning, has come online. He says, does the Mornington Peninsula produce any Chardonnays that have the age excuse me, the ageing capacity of Montrachet or Merceau. I have tasted over 20-year-old Merceau that was extraordinarily rich. Yes, Peter, you're talking my language. Um, I, I don't think there's any problem with these wines lasting. The best of these wines, well cellared, will last for 20 years and the screw caps will, will help them last that long. Um, great white burgundies, as such as you have mentioned, Montrachet, Merceau, and so on, they can live to be a lot older than 20 years if they happen to have a good cork and if they happen to have been well cellared. But I've tasted a lot of great white burgundies or from great vineyards with extortionate prices, which have been really, you know, no good, that, have fall, that haven't lasted, usually because of their cork or because they didn't have enough sulfur added to them. Random oxidation is a, has been a big thing in Burgundy. I think they're gradually getting over it now, but um, I don't. I don't. I wouldn't be selling a lot of white burgundies for a long period of time, unless it's a producer that I know is reliable and has a reputation for long aging, um, and they do exist. Certainly, they I mean, the, the best of Chardonnay is, still comes from Burgundy, but the prices are really, really high, and the reliability is not that great. Okay, so that's um, just to recap on that Crittenden wine. It's a down the hill wine, it tastes to me, to me more like an up the hill wine. It's the Cri de Coeur, which is their top, uh, their top Chardonnay and their top Pinots, or one of their top Pinots is under the Cri de Coeur label. Cri de Coeur is Cry from the Heart. Um, and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty swish wine. I would also uh, answer the next question, which is, can I comment on price points? Some of these Chardonnays are over $50 a bottle, and I have to ask how much of this is reflecting true cost and how much is just what the market will accept. What do you mean by true cost? I don't think anybody knows what true cost is. Um, the cost of growing the grapes is, is higher in cool climates, partly because you have more trouble with moulds and, and, and marginal weather and, uh, and um, uh, yields are, are, are normally lower in cool climates because grapevines are less fruitful in cool climates. Um, so the costs are higher. And if you look at, I already mentioned the real estate cost in Mornington, it's high. The cost of land is very high there. So all these things have to be taken into account. And you might have noticed that some of these wines, one of them is $100 and one of them is about $50 or $55. Is the quality difference that different? Probably not, but it depends on the year and it depends a bit on your own taste as well. But um, you know, Australian Chardonnay between 50, great Australian Chardonnay is the best of them, between $50 and $100 a bottle are still, I think, reasonably good value or quite often very good value compared to the equivalent from other parts of the world especially burgundy where you won't find a good premier crew burgundy for under a couple of hundred dollars a bottle now um, and the grand crew is well let's not even talk about it um, so yeah i think that um, that the top wine is now costing quite a lot of money and part of the reason for that is there is now a market, a big market for these wines, which perhaps didn't exist quite as much in the past. Okay, I'm going to move on to the reds and take this uh, red wine glass. And the first one we're going to have is from up the hill, Main Ridge Estate. I think I've already mentioned Main Ridge Estate was one of the very first growers to, um, to plant 
in the modern era of Mornington Peninsula wine. And the founders were Nat and Rosalie White. 1976 was the year they established Main Ridge Estate. As it sounds, it's on the top of the ridge, which is Red Hill. And the soil is red, deep red volcanic soil, basalt soil, uh, which runs along the highest parts of the ridge in Mornington Peninsula. But it, you don't find the basalt down in the lower parts. It's more of a gray, um, uh, gray sandy loam soil down, down in the bottom parts. So the Red, red Hill is aptly named, you might say. Um, they, uh, they sold, and the white, Nat and Rosalie White sold the vineyard in 2015 after they'd been there for 35 years. And for 35 years, they'd been at the very pinnacle of Mornington Peninsula wine, making great wine, but also helping everybody else who was establishing. A lot of people who established after them were mentored by them and uh, helped with viticulture and winemaking by especially by Nat, who was, um, who was an engineer originally, but he, after he planted the vineyard, he decided to get serious about the uh, science and he did a course, I think at Charles Sturt Uni, and learned all about it and passed, generously used his knowledge with other people. So now the, the property is owned by the Sexton family and James Sexton is a winemaker. James was previously in hospitality. He was a waiter, a sommelier and a restaurant manager and embarked on a course of study at CSU himself to learn about winemaking after taking over Mainridge Estate. So history repeats itself. Um, 240 metres altitude is, is Mainridge Estate and uh, it's quite high. So you would expect this wine to be the delicate, fragrant, ethereal style of Pinot, perhaps. But is it? Let's taste it. Colour is remarkably deep. It's not as deep as a Shiraz or a Cabernet, but it's deep for Pinot. And it has this beautiful clarity and brightness with a lot of purple in the rim. That's superb colour. Oh, did I say it's the half acre Pinot? I don't think I did. Um, just before I taste it, I should introduce it properly. It is the Main Ridge Estate Half Acre Pinot, which is 2019 vintage. This is their top Pinot. It's about $190, I think $90 to $100 a bottle. Uh, the second rank Pinot is called The Acre. And it's a bit cheaper, but it's very, very good as well. So let's look at the wine. That's the colour is already remarked on. The nose is exquisite. Wow, that's a beautiful perfume. How to describe it? Crushed raspberries, dark plums, very subtle barrel influence. The oak is really hard to distinguish, but it's there. That is it's slightly floral. It's just a beautiful nose, but it's a rich nose, a ripe nose. It's more like a, a really serious burgundy nose than a lot of Aussie Pinots. Um, but it's got that ripeness and that gravitas it's really hard to describe why but it has that's a very impressive bouquet and the wine well that is a mouthful of wine anybody who thinks that high altitude mornington pinot is delicate and ethereal and pale and you know beautiful, but different style would have to you know, rethink their um, opinions when they taste that wine. That is quite a full Pinot for Mornington, and there's a, there's plenty of tannin there. It's not grippy, but the tannin is really adding structure and length and gravitas to the palate of that wine. It's beautiful. Um, I think that's an outstanding Pinot and one of the better wines that I've seen from that vineyard in recent times. Uh, we scored at 95 out of 100, gold ribbon score, and it was number 10 out of 57 Pinots from the Peninsula in that year, 2019, so it's a top-ranked wine. It's um, a 10, we've said 10 years, drink it for 10 years, but gee, it'll go for 20 easily. I have no doubt that one. And I've tasted some of the old pinots from this uh, vineyard and they do age beautifully and most of them are under cork so under screw cap you can you can you can i think uh, bank on it aging well for longer 
Uh, we asked James Sexton what he would like to serve with it, and he said beef wellington. So that's a pretty hearty dish to have with a pinot, but that's a confident call by James. He's also said mushroom wellington if you're a vegetarian. Well, I would think that, uh, yeah, I don't know what a mushroom wellington is, but uh, a beef, beef wellington would be fantastic. I think that's a gorgeous, gorgeous wine. And I think that if that's the sort of thing that the new owners are doing, the, uh, then the white, Nat White in particular, will be very, very happy with the hands that his vineyard is, is in now. It's a blend of five different clones, incidentally, which some people might find interesting. So moving along, God, I hate to pour that out, but I'm going to have to. Um, moving along to uh, the second Pinot, which is Dexter. Todd Dexter's um, a person that I went through Roseworthy College with, Roseworthy Ag College. He was studying there at the same time as me. And he'd just come back from, um, from uh, California where he'd been working in the Napa Valley at Cake Bread Cellars, which is renowned for its Cabernet. So it's a bit ironic that he ended up in the Mornington Peninsula making Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and uh, not Cabernet. Although I'm sure he made Cabernet in his early days on the peninsula because he was for many years the chief winemaker at Stonia. And Stonia did make Cabernet, probably still does make Cabernet, but Cabernet has been pushed out of the peninsula in a big way in recent years. Um, while he was at Stonia, he established his own vineyard at Tuarong, which is down in the lower part of the peninsula, down towards the Murduck Plains. Um, and uh, that was in, I think, uh, 1987. So quite the vines are quite mature now. Uh, the Dexter Vineyard and all of his wines come from the Dexter Vineyard, from his own vineyard. He makes them himself. Uh, there's only two wines. It's Chardonnay and Pinot. Every now and then he makes a reserve, but usually not. Uh, not in my experience anyway. Um, and um, I think he's an outstanding winemaker. He's doing a bit of consulting around the district as well as making his own wines. Has 40 years of winemaking experience to lean on. Um, being at Turong, which is um, uh, in the lower part of the peninsula, but I think it's not right at the very low end of the peninsula. And to me, these wines straddle the low and the high in terms of the style. They are perhaps a little heavier than um, or richer than a lot of the cooler climate wines, such as the Stonia wines, for example, and not as rich as, say, the Muraduck wines, which we will come to at the end here. They straddle that, that middle ground and do it very, very well. The colour of this wine is a light red-purple. So you know, it's a good colour. It's good depth of colour, but it is, it's certainly light for a red wine colour, but it's about right for a really good Pinot colour. It's very bright, good purple tinges. And the aromas are very fragrant. There's a lot of red fruits. There. There's raspberry, strawberry, red cherry, um, really the redder fruit aromas rather than the dark fruit aromas. Beautiful. Spicy as well. And I reckon this wine is actually opening up. I first opened it a few hours ago and it's starting to, to really open up. So that wine is more like I would expect a, a cooler expression of Mornington Pinot is delicate, it is fine, it is intense, but it's not a heavy or full-bodied wine or even medium full-bodied. It is a gorgeous wine, but it, it's got the finesse about it is what really um, makes an impression. Delicious wine, lovely core of succulent sweet fruit, but nice fine grain tannins to dry the finish and give you length and structure. It's a beautiful Pinot. What did we score it? We scored it 96, so a good high gold score. And it was number one, would you believe, out of 57 Mornington Pinots from 2019. So it's a top rank wine. You can't get any higher than that. So it has to be top rank. And we said drink it um, till 2031. So it's only 12 years, but it's going to last longer than that. But that's probably the window of optimal drinking, I guess. 
Beautiful wine, $60 a bottle. I mean, that's a really good value, you have to say, compared to Pinots of that class from other parts of the world. I'm not just talking about Burgundy, but Oregon, California, other places, um, Central Otago. What did Todd say that he would like to eat with this? He said butterfly leg of lamb cooked on the barbecue. He's given us two choices. There's the lamb or there is a duck breast with a sauce, not too sweet sauce of your own choice. And I think that's a really good um, suggestion because a sweet sauce would, would, would not go well with this wine. Sweet sauces are too gloopy and um, you know, that would spoil the wine. It's got to have a mild level of sweetness at the most to go with this wine. So beautiful wine and um, yeah, a wine that's probably not that well known and deserves to be better known. And the same can be said for the next one, which is... Eldridge Estate, but before, I'll just pour some of that out, actually, but I'm going to take some questions before we describe this wine um, and move on to the last two wines of the, is that centred? I think it's centred. Yeah. So let me just see if there's a question waiting in the box here. Rob Pierce says, can you talk to the difference between Mornington, Tassie and Canberra Pinots? Well, Canberra is quite easy because there aren't many Pinots of, of great moment coming out of the Canberra district. Even Clonakilla sources its Pinot Noir from Tumbarumba. Um, Lark Hill makes a reasonable Pinot. There are some good Pinots in the district, but it's not a region that's noted for Pinot. Um, Tasmania, well, there are many parts of Tasmania. Um, you know, from the Huon Valley, that really well-named valley down in the south, which is really cold, um, up to um, Tamar Valley, which is one of the warmer areas, and East Coast, which is quite a warm area, and then up further north to Piper's Brook, which is cool and humid. Um, uh, warm in Tasmania is still cool by Australian standards. Uh, in terms of their... I think, I think we need to go to a real review webinar on Tasmania to answer that question because the, the, the differences between makers and sub-regions in Tasmania are enormous, even, even more marked than they are in Mornington. And it's very hard to generalise about these, these wines. But um, what can I say that would be a, a, a rounding out comment it's, it's very hard to generalise. I really find generalising is a trap. Um, Mornington Pinots have been great for a long time. Tasmanian Pinots, a few of them have been great for a long time. And, and now we're seeing a huge number of Tasmanian Pinots really starting to hit their straps. And I think it's very, very exciting what's going, what's going on there. So I might just uh, dodge that one, Rob. I'm sorry, but it's just... Uh, you really need to talk about specifics and um, we need a lot more time than I've got. Another question from Peter quickly is how widespread is the use of multiple clones to produce a Pinot? Um, we're about to talk clones because we've got Eldridge Estate and this is a clonal blend. Um, and he's talking about Mornington, Tassie, Adelaide Hills, Burgundy. Multiple clones are hugely common in Pinot Noir making everywhere. Um, there are more clones in Pinot Noir than any other grape variety. And that's probably because it, it mutates more than other varieties. And so it throws out sports, I suppose you call them, which um, can be very, very different. And, you know, some clones of Pinot Noir, it's more like tasting a Gamay or a Pinot Mernier than it is tasting a Pinot Noir. They're so different. Um, but the other region, the other, oh, the first reason that you would use clonal selection is to suit the clones to your terroir, to your vineyard site. That's very important. Some clones suit some sites better than others. Um, and the other thing is that the more clones you've got, the more complexity in flavour and aroma you've potentially got. So multi-clones is a good thing to do. Um, also, some clones might get hit by frost and other clones not in the same, same event. So it's an insurance thing as well. There are many reasons to, to use multiple clones. 
Um, single clone Pinot vineyards are very rare in Burgundy. They're more interested in using massal selection these days. Massal selection means sampling the vine stock in existing vineyards, which is usually quite complex. And, um, and I think that's pretty much the thinking in Australia now as well. Multiple clones is the way to go. So th that's a great segue into this wine, which is the Eldridge Estate Clonal Blend Pinot Noir which is 2018 vintage. Eldridge Estate is Red Hill, which is up on the, the Red Hill. Again, not far from Main Ridge Estate, very close to Main Ridge Estate. And again, the same sort of altitude, um, well above 200 metres and probably more like 250. And um, tiny little vineyard, 4.3 hectares, uh, and somehow David Lloyd, the owner, manages to grow eight different clones of Pinot Noir and about five different clones of Chardonnay. Plus he has Gamay, plus he has Sauvignon Blanc. Um, he makes a barrel fermented Fumé Blanc and he makes a blend of Pinot and Gamay, which is called PTG. Very nice wine as well. Um, David Lloyd already had 20 years of 20 vintages under his belt before he came to Red Hill and established Elbridge Estate. So he was celebrating um, um, 25 years at Elbridge Estate in the 2020 vintage. And um, very sadly, he was not able to make the wine that year because he was in hospital suffering, suffering from a serious illness. But he's back on his feet now, and I think he's been making the 2021 vintage. Um, as usual. So there are seven of the eight clones in this wine. Seven clones. Let's have a taste of it. Oh, just a couple more things. It's dry grown, which is quite a common thing in the peninsula. The soils are quite sustaining and, and the rainfall is quite good there. So you can get through without irrigation most of the time, especially on the higher parts. It's hand harvested. It's de-stemmed. He doesn't use any whole bunch. Um, and this is just a selection of the best four barrels of this wine. So that would be 900 litres, which is 100 dozen. Um, so a very small make. That's a boutique vineyard, a micro boutique vineyard. Look at the colour of this wine. It's really quite light. That is more like the colour that I would expect of an up the hill Mornington Pinot. A real, it's not pale, but it's quite light. And there is nice purple tinge. It's very bright. It's a good colour. So never judge Pinot by the, by the depth of colour. Um, it's often very misleading. The grapes don't, have, don't always have a, a great amount of colour pigments in their skin. The perfume is lovely. There's a smoky, spicy, small goods kind of, smoked small goods kind of overtone there. Uh, but there's walnutty aromas. There's all sorts of intriguing things happening there. And there's red fruit flavours too, but they're partially in hiding at the moment. Mm. This is a lighter bodied wine. This is a very classic up the hill, red hill style of Pinot Noir. Very intense, good penetration and driving flavor on the palate. Understated wine, a delicate understated wine. Really a lovely balanced wine with um, um, a lot to like in that wine, but you would suit that wine with different foods than some of the other wines that we're tasting tonight because of its delicacy. It's a lovely, lovely wine. We scored it 93 out of 100, and we've, it's, um, uh, we've said drink from now until 2033. So again, 10 to 12 years for the drinking window, but it will go longer. $75 a bottle. And the food match that David Lloyd has suggested, he said, uh, lamb, lamb bake with tahini sauce and tomatoes. And he, he quotes Gotham Ottolenghi's simple book, page 212. So if you want to go to that and make it, that's where you go. Um, he, uh, he's very specific, David. Uh, and that is a lovely, lovely wine. Right, the last one, we've got five minutes left. And that's just enough to taste Rick McIntyre's beautiful Mooraduck Estate wine. Mooraduck Estate, we're going down the hill here. So what we've done with the Pinots is we've gone uphill, downhill, uphill, downhill. 
And this wine is um, a good example of downhill. Now, let's, let's talk about the McIntyre family because they're really pivotal in the region. They do quite a bit of contract winemaking for other people as well as themselves. Rick McIntyre was a surgeon. Um, and he, when he was working in London as a young surgeon, he ran in, he discovered wine while he was there and it became his, his hobby and his passion. And when he got home, he decided to buy some land and make wine. And of course, this was way back in um, 1982 when people like Nat White and uh, Gary Crittenden were there and were able to mentor Rick McIntyre and teach him a bit about uh, winemaking and he has done extremely well. His wife, Jill, is an expert in the kitchen and she ran a, a, a restaurant at the Vineyard for quite a number of years. Their daughter, Kate, is a master of wine and she is the sales marketing manager and does all sorts of other jobs as well, including working at Vintage Time, anything that needs doing. Um, Rick McIntyre was one of the first in the area to use wild yeasts or naturally occurring vineyard yeasts instead of using pure cultures. And he loves anything to do with yeast. So he's a dedicated baker. He makes bread every day. He's, he makes great pizzas. And he's a general aficionado of anything that involves yeast. Um, and in fact, he used to walk around with a T-shirt that said wild yeast on it. Probably still does. So Muraduck Estate is in the Muraduck Plains area, which is quite low altitude, um, not far from the Port Phillip Bay uh, shore. And the wines are, I think, potential as best examples of Pinot from this sort of terroir being darker coloured, richer and fuller bodied than most Mornington Pinots. They really do what they do well. They're not scared of tannin at, uh, at Muraduck Estate. Um, a lot of Pinot makers are scared of tannin, according to Rick McIntyre, and I think he's right. They think good tannins are, you know, very desirable in Pinot Noir and their wines are living examples of that. All of their wines are de-stemmed, so they don't have any bunchy characters except one, which is called the Garden Vineyard, which is not their own vineyard, but someone else's vineyard. So this wine is, again, it's not their own vineyard. It's from the Robinson Vineyard, which is very close to the Muraduck Estate Vineyard itself. Same soil, same mesoclimate, same pretty much everything. And in fact, it's managed by the same guy that manages the Muraduck Estate Vineyards, which is Hugh Robinson, who runs a big contract viticulture business in the peninsula and looks after a lot of vineyards. So this is from Hugh Robinson's own vineyard, but made at Muraduck by um, Rick McIntyre and his winemaker, Jeremy Magyar. Let's have a taste. So a nice, deep, rich color. Nice, deep, rich color. Just a little bit of purple still lingering there at three years of age. Um, but the bouquet, wow, well, that's a knockout. It has got a lot of spice, a lot of um, meaty characters, rich, earthy characters, smoky characters, um, black fruits, all sorts of things happening there. There's a, it's a really, really engaging bouquet this wine has. I just, it makes me want to guzzle it just having a sniff. Mm. Very rich, very full-bodied, relatively speaking. I mean, it's not full-bodied like a Shiraz, but for Pinot Noir, it's full. And for Mornington, it's certainly full. It is a really, really lovely, lovely wine. There's a core of sweet fruit and there's a lot of tannin there, but the tannin is soft, sexy tannin, very smooth, fine-grained tannin, just beautifully balanced wine. I think that's wonderful. It's scored 92 out of 100, and we said drink it till 2030, but I reckon that's probably very conservative. I'd say drink it to 2035 at least. It scored 33 out of 83 Pinots from that vintage in the region. I think um, um, if I was, that's a, a year, at least a year ago, I think I tasted that. And I think that it's age is actually improving this wine. It's a beautiful wine. What have they said to drink it with? They've said, um, Confit duck legs with a wild mushroom ragu, fantastic. It's not just duck that goes really well with Pinot, but mushrooms go well with Pinot as well. If you put the two together, you've got heaven. You've got heaven. So thank you, Richard, and thank you, Jeremy. That's wonderful wine. And apologies for not putting it on the 
pedestal there. I should have been doing that. We're not quite finished. We, we might take another question before we knock off, but we're nearly over time. Um, and uh, Kate McIntyre has just done a Zoom cast herself, which she does every week. And they're well worth looking at. I've sat in on one or two of those myself. Um, and she's just come online because she's finished her own Zoom cast. Patty Gratton Smith says, Mornington Peninsula has many great golf courses. It's a playground, the Mornington Peninsula. There is a lot to like there. You've got beaches, you've got, you know, you've got hills to climb, you've got a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> um, Peter Gunning says, do you see an Aussie Pinot on the path to a similar status to Grange or Hill of Grace? Um, definitely. I mean, if you look at Bass Phillip, Bass Phillip Reserve is now nearly $800 a bottle, I think. Um, there's only a tiny amount of it made, but then there's only a tiny amount of Hill of Grace made too. Um, I think that there are several Pinots that are knocking on the door of that kind of greatness. And the other uh, Muraduck Estate Pinot, which is made from the McIntyre Vineyard, which is their home vineyard at Muraduck Estate, which is their highest price Pinot, I think is one of the great Pinots of that area. And it's knocking on the door. There's quite a few others uh, that I could name in, in Mornington. Uh, Yabby Lake's top single block wines are outstanding. Um, there, is, there are lots of wines around the country that I think are knocking on the door. Paringa Estates, top wine, which is called the Paringa. Um, yep, I think that we, um, we're well on the way to establishing great reputation for Pinot Noir. And I'm going to go a little over time and just say that one of my hobby horses is that um, we produce such great Shiraz and Cabernet and many other varieties of red in Australia that Pinot gets overlooked. But we do great Pinot Noir. Um, and I think that the fact that we do so much of a great other varieties overshadows Pinot. It doesn't get the attention it deserves. Uh, the world will discover it eventually, but by then it's probably going to be too expensive. Um, and Kate is, uh, is, 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 is putting a few things in here. In the 80s, we were told Pinot wouldn't work anywhere other than Burgundy and not to bother planting it. Good thing we were stubborn. A very good thing that you are stubborn. Um, thanks for that, Kate. So that's about it from me. I think I should sign off from there and just mention that you can buy, I think, all of these wines, probably most of them at least, by going on the Buy Direct button, which will plug you through to the winery's website. And I would urge you to subscribe to The Real Review, go to our Sell the Door to Door website, order direct from the winery, blah, 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 blah. But please um, subscribe to us. If you like what we do, Bob Campbell, my colleague, will be on location in Marlborough uh, for the next um, uh, cast, which will be on the 6th of May. And my next one which will be in the Barossa Valley, which um, I'm not, it will be on the Barossa Valley. I don't think we're going there, but it'll be a Zoom cast on the Barossa Valley. Don't actually have the date here, but it will be sometime in May. So thank you very much for joining me tonight. And I hope uh, that you've had at least one of these gorgeous wines to taste. It's been a, a stellar lineup, I've got to say. Um, one of the best lineups we've had. So uh, until next time, good night. <laughs>